It's the Task Management and Time Blocking Podcast, episode 34. You're someone who is well acquainted with the skill of capturing. In other words, you know that it's important to write everything down that's important. You know better than to keep it all in your, her- all in your head. <laughs> that's a basic productivity lesson. But lately, you've noticed that the number of things you need to write down or capture has exploded. It seems as if it's just like the other day when a post-it note was enough. And now you're writing everything down in something like a notebook or maybe on your phone and you feel as if you can't catch up. What's wrong? What else should you be doing? Tune into this episode to hear from me and my special guest, Brad Aon, as we solve this wicked task management problem together. I'm Francis Wade, and welcome to the Task Management and Time Blocking Podcast. And welcome back. And as you can see, we are joined on our podcast by Dr. Brad Aon. And before I introduce Brad, let me just tell you a little bit about this particular format, because you probably have not been on a podcast like this one before, unless you've heard one of our prior episodes. So things are a bit different. We're actually here to solve a very difficult problem. So uh, I have invited Brad to join me in my virtual office. I'm in Jamaica and he's in Montreal. Montreal, right, Brad? That's correct, yes. We're far away from each other, but we're going to act as if we are together, putting our best thinking towards a solution of the problem that I introduced in the introduction. So this isn't an interview, and I'm not going to ask Brad what his favorite book is and what his favorite pet and colors. (laughs) No. We're putting our heads together to try to give you some insight as the listener to a problem that many, if not most, or, or maybe all of us have to some degree. And what we're going to do is hack away at the problem, spend most of the time diagnosing it. And then as we diagnose it, you'll start to hear solutions based on the conversation that we're having. Because what we're trying to do is have some unique insights, generate some kind of serendipitous moments. And if we have one of those, I'll put a bell in. You probably hear a bell, you know, as these serendipitous moments take place. If we get to the end of the podcast and there's no serendipity, I'll put in a buzzer. (laughs) Time out. I don't know. But, you know, this is really inspired by something Einstein said, that he had an hour to solve a problem. He'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. So here we are. So let me tell you a quick story and then I'll introduce Brad. Karen has lots of ideas. Plus, people admire her way of always writing everything down. Well, now she has one of her good insights. She's quick to put it in one of her blue notebooks. She has one at home, one for her car, and another at work. She writes down great notes from meetings, in-person and virtual meetings. And people know she's the only one who has notes from meetings and get-togethers from over a year ago. She even has seven notebooks. These are prior notebooks that are completely filled up to the last page With notes, they're sitting on her desk at home. So she's been doing this for a while. And there are some good things in them, right? For sure. That's why she's not throwing them away, all seven. But guess what? Lately, she's been feeling a bit overwhelmed. More than a few times, she's looked for notes in the wrong notebook. She can't recall which one she last used. So some critical tasks are slipping through the cracks. It's produced a few embarrassments in meetings when tasks she was assigned were not completed. They were written down, but they got lost in the pages of detail notes. So even though she's trying harder to keep perfect notes, this approach isn't working. So Dr. Brad Ayon is a time management researcher who specializes in the dynamics of time, combining sociology, anthropology, psychology, history, and philosophy. His expertise extends beyond academia, but a TED Talk, and features in major media like the BBC News and The Guardian. Brad actively collaborates with various organizations offering tailored time management and productivity training. He also founded a startup based providing evidence-based training to enhance team productivity, well-being, and work-life balance. Brad, welcome to the show. 
Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's great to great to have you. We've we've had you be at a couple of our conferences and it was awesome having you. And um that's I guess forms the basis for why we're inviting you today because giving us some decent insights before probably means you'll give us some today. But no pressure, right? <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, thank you. It's it's always a, a pleasure, really. Great, 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 great. So what do you think of Karen? Have you have you met a Karen before? And what do you think of people like that? Uh, to be fully honest, I, I wish <laughs> I wish I had met more Karens. Uh, the the reality is that like even though her <clears throat> her approach might not be optimal, um, m the vast majority of people I know do not even get there, uh, meaning that they don't even have one notebook, let alone many notebooks uh, to uh, you know to offload their thoughts, their ideas, their uh, uh, brainstorming notes and 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 I think that's um, uh, that's a shame because uh, you know we live in an age of cognitive overload uh, and we don't even realize it you know like if if you think about okay think about the average person around the ninth or the tenth century or even the twelfth century uh, mm -hmm. imagine you're in Western Europe somewhere like France or Germany and you're not a king you're not a prince you're just like a regular uh, person. Now imagine your day-to-day -day life. You're not going to be exposed to a lot of information. You, you don't see billboards. You don't see magazines. You don't get no emails, no text messages. Um, you don't have to deal with uh, phone calls. The, the most you're going to, the most information you're going to be uh, exposed to is uh, the village's gossip. Uh, you know, like maybe your cousin has, uh, you know, a, a new cow, and that's the the news of the day. And, and assuming you were literate, assuming you knew how to read, maybe, maybe the one of the books you're going to be exposed to is, is the Bible. And that's about it. Now, compare that to today. We live in truly unprecedented times historically. Like you wake up from most people I know, they wake up. First thing they do is reach for their smartphone then look at their emails, maybe look at the news. And already you've consumed probably more novel information than someone in the uh 15th century uh, by by the time you know by 8 a.m or by 9 a.m and and Karen Karen's of the world you said you you wish there were more of them because most of us are consuming but we don't do anything with what we consume right that's right we uh you know there's um I I think you know I, I know this is about time management uh but I think in the 21st century um the, the foundation of time management should be information management because uh, you're right we consume a lot of information um the way we organize it might not always be uh smart if, if that makes sense <laughs> well <laughs> it's hard it's hard to say right because you, you 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 it's hard to sort of point fingers at us i would say because we you know we're not trained to operate in the world that we're living in. we're not expected to we're, we're more like karen you know Karen probably didn't even have a writing implement. It, that probably even came later when pencils and bits of lead were were crafted and paper became more of a thing that you had. And then literacy, you know. So you know, she had several obstacles to doing what we do today. Yes. But but she learned, and most people, I guess, train themselves to write. It had to have been through some intervention because it doesn't come naturally to do that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So something happened and, and they decided, okay, I'm going to be someone who writes everything down. Yeah. And these people are, I, I agree with you, these people are very rare and they're very effective compared to the people who write nothing down, who try yes. to remember everything because they get themselves in all kinds of trouble, right? Absolutely. Uh, and, and, you know, some people, you, you said it doesn't come naturally to us. That's absolutely true. Sometimes, we do have like a reflex when uh, we're uh, in the kitchen and we want to remember to buy some milk. We just uh, stick a, a post-it note to the fridge saying, remember to buy the milk or remember dentist appointment. But that's about it. Um, I, I think it certainly doesn't come to us naturally. And uh, and there's, it, it's, 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 I think, like you said, it's, it could be literacy. It could be, uh, it could be applied to any skill really uh, right. when you train yourself to do it. Uh, it becomes a lot easier. But I think that the default for most people is really to 
try to keep everything in the back of your of your mind. Um, and our Karen minds are back in the brains. Yeah, exactly. But still, Karen has a problem. So, so as we're, you know, probably the audience that we're getting are, are people who already know about capturing, right? They already have, they've already been through getting things done or they've been exposed to some philosophy um, that they, in which they are already capturing. This is not a brand new, and if it is, this might not be the episode for them, but there's other episodes that I could listen to. But the idea is that you capture by writing or typing or voice recording, or if you have a, you know, if you have a useful, you know, secretary, admin, aide de camp or something, you have someone you can give instructions to and they keep everything in their head or they write them down for you. But the point is that everything important is recorded somehow and it's not left just to memory and some recall and yeah. random triggers and whatnot. But most of most people, I think, listening to our podcast, they know this. They know this, this, this practice, and they've been it's been recommended, and they probably recommend it to others. But Karen, Karen's practice of writing everything down does not match the world that she lives in any longer. Mm -hmm. And she, by virtue of writing everything down, she gets overwhelmed and she's feeling buried and it used to work but it's no longer working and i would say that we, we we all have to go through some kind of a phase of a karen phase i think in our productivity journeys like at some point we learned and some point we tried and some point we probably decided but then the karens didn't adjust the way the rest of us did the karens Sort of in you know had the initial success and then just kept writing everything down but what happened if, if if she doesn't make the adjustment at some point in the in the future um what, what will her future look like brad do you think i think there's two um two main two main problems the first one is um the hoarding problem uh maybe you've heard of uh people that have a hoarding issue where um like that tv show <laughs> exactly. This. Yes. Uh, compulsively, they're going to keep everything, regardless of whether it's useful, important, uh, or even still uh, usable. Uh, so they would keep like old pieces of uh, I don't know, newspapers, uh, old gadgets, old pens that don't even work anymore. They want to keep everything in their house. I some of those. You know, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, as long as it doesn't become an issue where your house is so cluttered that you can't even find what you need anymore. Or you can't even, sometimes in extreme cases, you can't even walk within your apartment because uh, literally there's no space anymore because you've been hoarding for 40 years or 50 years. You're, you're, you're filled to the brim with, with, with pens. Yes. So um, Karen could be a hoarder of, I guess, information in this case, right? not physical objects, but a hoarder of data. That, that's right. And I think that's hog even, of some kind. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's not even the, the most common problem. I, I, I think to get to that level, you would have to be very, very systematic in the way you uh, capture data. I know very few people who do that systematically because to get to a point where you have so much information that's captured that, that it becomes a hoarding issue, it means that you do it very consistently, very frequently. And, and I don't think that most, I, I think there's very few people in that category. I think the main problem is that people like Karen capture a lot of information, but they don't make the time to implement it. Because the, the very purpose of capturing information is that at some point in your life, if not now, maybe later, it is going to be useful. It is going to be implemented. Maybe you, you have a thought about a potential side gig or a business or something to fix your, the, current, the way you currently work. But if it's just stored somewhere and you never uh, uh, look into it, then for all intents and purposes, it becomes useless. So, so Karen's overwhelm comes from a feeling of probably uh, underlining the, the hoarding and the feeling as if I'm going to miss out, a fear of missing out in the future, I guess. Yes. There is an underlying fear. And I guess, the, uh, unfortunately, she can never capture enough to have the fear go away. So, yes, and in fact, it becomes a vicious, uh, vicious cycle because uh -huh. as you capture more things, 
compared to the average person who who doesn't mm -hmm. capture anything the average mm -hmm. person forgets like sometimes has good ideas and then forgets mm -hmm. about them uh, mm -hmm. but people like karen has good ideas captures them mm -hmm. and then becomes more and more aware of the many many things she could be doing and that creates mm -hmm. a sense of uh anxiety anxiety overwhelm like like you put mm -hmm. it because we become mm -hmm. more aware of what we could or should be doing rather than mm -hmm. just forgetting about them. So this is the weird thing, I guess. You're saying that the capturing doesn't, at her level, it, it, it stops reducing the anxiety and it actually increases it. So yes, her capturing doesn't scale, in other words. Yes, because there's a, it, it, there, there's a growing disconnect between what you can do your day-to-day -day capacity and what you could be doing. And this actually happened to a friend of mine uh, two yeah. years ago because he was, um, he's the CEO of a, a very, um, uh, very, uh, not powerful, very uh, successful company uh, in Canada. And he asked me about exactly that, like how can I better capture information? And I recommended at the time what worked best what worked best for him was uh, Notion, hmm. and it's an app where you can capture literally everything. And two months later, he sent me a link to one of his Notion pages where he had a list of movies he wanted to watch, and another one a list of articles that he wanted to read articles from the the media, articles from uh, you know like research, and he told me it became an issue because it makes him realize more and more that there's so many things that he could be doing like all the articles to read all the movies to watch and so little time um and and so it just makes it i, I guess for some people it makes us more aware of what we're missing out on every day well oh i i well, i've never i never i never had that thought i never realized that and had that thought before but I, I i can see it now that we're distinguishing it maybe it should be our first our first insight that capturing too much increases anxiety and it, it, it's meant to it's meant to save you from anxiety and to take things off your mind and give you peace of mind and then you as a as a Karen you take it to the next level and it gets much 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 worse Yes. Um, so oh. it, it's it's interesting you mentioned this because just yesterday a colleague of mine sent me this very recent study on the, the concept of uh, choice overload. So you know how you, you go to the grocery store and you oh, want to yeah. buy a box of cereal? Yeah, uh, yeah. If there's maybe two or three of them, it's easy for you to pick the one that you like best. But if right. like at, uh, in Walmart in the, in the United States, there is literally like hundreds of of potential brands of cereal sometimes we just like we we have this paralysis it's called per, um, analysis paralysis where there's so much choice the selection is so wide that you can't even start to think about okay what what do i pick uh, so you then walk out with no any cereal because <laughs> you're all you're all well now i've heard the story of folks who have moved to the u.s and walk into a, a grocery store for the first time and their mind explodes. Yes. And they have to run. They have to, or even people who, even Americans who have lived abroad and come back to the U.S. and they walk into, the, like you said, the Walmart or super, 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 what's the super Walmart called? Uh, Walmart. The super center? I, I, oh, yeah. Uh, Sam's I think Club? it's Sam's Club. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the mega ones. And yes. they go into the, one of those and, and all of a sudden they're like, Boom, because they're used to three three boxes of cereal, not five hundred. Yes, and they uh, end up, I, it, it's, they end it's up in very analysis paralysis. It, it, yeah. And it's especially, I think you're right. When you compare it across countries, I've spent a few months in um, in South Africa once, and after that, going straight to Boston, Massachusetts, uh, and I was at a at a gas station. Uh, and, and in the gas station, you have the, the, the store. The store alone had more options than everything I'd seen in the previous months in any store in South Africa. Like you want some Gatorade or some Mountain Dew, there's nine different flavors just for that. Um, and, and, and the same applies to information. Like when people gather and gather and gather, like, oh, I could be working on this project. I could be watching this movie. Um, 
then when you go back and you look at your notes, you realize, oh my God, I only have 24 hours in a day. And yet all these things that I could be doing. And it creates a sense of, like you said, overwhelm, anxiety, um, but also a sense of time pressure. Because you know when people say, I don't have time, or I feel like I don't have time, it's not always objective. It's about the subjective perception of it. And what we see consistently around the world is that, believe it or not, the people that feel the most pressed for time are the people that could afford to work less, like people that, that are highly educated, people that make a lot of money. Those are the ones that are consistently pressed for time. And it's not just about work. It's also because in their cultural preferences, they want to go to the theater. They want to go to the movies. They want to go to this ballet. They want to go do this uh, piano lessons. So because of all the things that they could do, they could be doing, it creates this sense of urgency. So many things I can do and yet so little time. So it's, so it's not analysis paralysis in the, the traditional sense. This is because each of the things that Karen has captured are meaningful to her. Mm -hmm. It's just that there's too many things that she's captured. So it's almost like self, self assignment analysis paralysis because yeah. she's kind of assigned these things to herself and said, oh, these are things I want to do. So she's routinely assigning 100 hours of stuff to a 40 hour a week or 300 years of stuff to a 70 year life. Yeah. If you want to blow it up um, and feeling the time pressure and thinking that probably thinking that it's not her fault. It's, it's never, uh, <laughs> for most people, it's never <laughs> her fault. <laughs> uh, that's the thing that a, a lot of people, so when I started doing research on time management, I felt I felt a bit um, like I, I almost never wanted to bring this up in public because I felt that people would feel attacked. That very often, especially in the West, especially if you're not wealthy but at least middle class, uh, usually when you don't have time, a good part of it is because of your choices, uh, and and obviously no one wants to hear that. Uh, better, so you better whisper that next time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so there are yeah, people listening to the podcast. <laughs> okay. Um, Cooking it off. Turn it off. Pause. <laughs> <laughs> swiping it. Swiping it right now because you know you just said something that. Say it again. Say it again. Really slow so that those who want to hear can hear. Well, that, that's that's the reality. There's research on this on the self-imposed time pressure, self-imposed. Mm -hmm. um, paralysis analysis paralysis and, and and it's i don't think it's a bad thing you know like being honest with ourselves is to me the first step towards making better decisions uh to give you a, a personal example when i was doing my phd i was making a lot of money i was making very very little money and so i decided to start using this app that tracks my expenses down to the cent uh, and for a whole year i did that and then i realized that over a whole year, I think I had spent $1,700 on pizza slices. There's a pizza slice, there's a pizza joint near the university and I would go there like multiple times a week. Uh, and, and just to give you a sense of perspective, that amount of money was more than 10% my annual income. Uh, Obviously, oh. that's not something that's uh, great when you realize it. You're like, oh, my God, look, am I, what have I done that is absolutely ill-advised? Um, but it was the first step towards better budgeting, towards more, I guess, rational, more reasonable uh, uh, use of my money. If they're eating for that matter. Uh, also that, too. Absolutely. It, you know, there are some harsh truths about ourselves. No one is perfect. Uh, and I think recognizing that and being honest with ourselves makes for good time management and good decisions in general yeah you know someone someone some smart person could say 1700 slices huh and then they'll add up all of the cheese on all those slices and show you that you ate 45 cubic feet of cheese in yes that is a lot <laughs> of which point you never eat pizza again for the rest of your life <laughs> that is the, a point lot of the point i'm making with that is that if we had feedback if karen had feedback when she added these bits of information to her books if there was some if there was something that could read 
oh, you just added 25 minutes. Or this is going to take you three hours to read. And congratulations, you've now added 40 more hours of reading to your day at the end of a day if it did that. Can you imagine what her reaction would be? She would be like, oh, I don't need to capture all of this. Actually, maybe yeah. I shouldn't. Maybe I, I, I don't, you know, it would give her, the immediate feedback would give her some, um, some reality check. Yes. So it would temper her sort of, I didn't want to say, you know, but her compulsion mm -hmm. to capture everything. Yeah. You know, I, I had a feeling that, you know, this, this reminds me of a feeling I had just yesterday. I went into YouTube and I found this history channel, right? And I've listened to uh, I listened to one of them. Um, and I looked at, yesterday. I was looking through all of the cool videos, history videos that they have in these channel in this channel. Each of them is like an hour long. So I can spend the rest of my life watching these videos. <laughs> it's like so many of them, right? Yeah. I started to feel just that what you mentioned that feeling of overwhelm. That I really like these history videos, and I think I should listen to them because I become a better person. But I'm on the verge of doing what Karen does, which is assigning myself an overwhelming task that I can never complete because I can never watch all the, 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 the history of videos on YouTube. I don't have enough life yep. left to do it. And there's people adding them faster than I can view them. Yes. So yep. I, it, I guess I've, I've forced myself to rationalize and say no. But it happened really quickly. And I imagine there's many people who are listening right now who have had to do the same. But there's the places where, like, for example, for Karen, where she's not done that yet. And the anxiety is only increasing. Yes. Because, as, as you said, she, she's like the cause of it. It's her choices. But in her mind, it's not like she's making conscious choices where she gets feedback each time she writes something down. That's right. And I think that's where maybe a concept that would help here is the concept of a signal to noise ratio. Mm -hmm. And it essentially means whenever you, uh, this is actually very relevant because it is about information uh, processing. When, when you're trying to capture information, you want to reduce the noise. So irrelevant or not super useful information. Uh, to prioritize the signal, so useful information. Uh, when I, um, I I used to do the thing when I was in my teenage years, where I would uh, compulsively save every article that I find interesting. Uh, th then you end up with a huge collection of articles that may or may not be interesting. Was, was that pre-internet days, or was that <laughs> that, that was uh, when uh, RSS feeds uh, became? Oh. Popular. I like those. <laughs> and so do many people who are listening. <laughs> oh, yeah. those are those are. They, they are great. Uh, I still use them, uh, but the compulsion to save like every potentially interesting article, I've increased my signal to noise ratio by only. Now what I do is I only uh, save things that are really, really groundbreaking, interesting, uh, that I think would be uh, worth revisiting at some point. So I, I used to say maybe 10, 12 articles a day. Now I'm at maybe one a week. Ah, okay. We're getting a little more into solutions though. We're really, we're really in the diagnostic part. So hold that thought for when we get to solutions because we'll, we'll come back with it. I think there's, there's, we'll go deeper with it. But so Karen is an anxiety, unfortunately putting herself in more anxiety and she thinks she's being productive. And everyone in her office thinks she's productive, but in fact, she's giving herself more anxiety and it's a function of the behaviors. Maybe that's why it's so difficult to solve this problem if you have it, because it, 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 it appears to be productive. It's more productive than the other guy, but ultimately it's not a winning strategy in today's world because there's too many things that we have to try to keep track of. That's right. Um, it, it, it needs another intervention in order to make to keep it productive. Otherwise, it will become unproductive. Uh, absolutely, I, I think to for for something to be productive, it has to lead to outcomes, to desired outcomes. Uh -huh. um, in that sense, just merely doing something is is not productive uh, in, in my definition. Like for instance, if someone is uh, 
constantly checking their emails, re responding to emails, but not actually focusing on their main job. Uh, to me, that's not being productive because the ultimate outcome that you want, which is to do a good quality uh, quality job, that's not being done. What you're doing is just tending to responding to uh, emails that may or may not be important. And the same thing with Karen. Um, noting down every minute mm -hmm. aspect that uh, mm -hmm. of daily life or things that you may be thinking about, that's, that's not productive if ultimately <laughs> what you want is to act on important ideas that are potentially mm -hmm. going to change your life for the better. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that almost says that if, if a Karen is focused, over-focused on one kind of productivity, then she'll eventually create a problem, an overall problem. And I think that's true for all of us because we don't have standard measures of productivity. It's easy for us to focus on the one, like replying to email mm -hmm. quickly. And there are some people who specialize in that, you know, in their office, they're the guy who replies to their email within five minutes every time, no matter what, right? And you wonder, how the heck do they get anything done? Well, the answer is they don't. <laughs> their job in their mind is to respond to email. So we don't have a sort of a balanced set of metrics to tell us how we're being productive. We have insights that people have derived, like Karen, the person who answers email, but we don't have like a dashboard that tells us, here's how we are doing overall. And yeah, we're capturing, but guess what? We just captured... 500 hours of tasks and we can no longer, we can't do them. Mm -hmm. We don't have anything telling us that we're creating a problem for ourselves. So we don't have any feedback. So that's a big, that seems to me a big, a big, big drawback. We don't, we don't have any, we don't have a sense of what a productive person is like in a kind of a, I would say general sense. Is that, how does that, how does that fit with your, that, that makes a, a lot of sense. I, I think that there's ways maybe to approximate it. So, for instance, mm -hmm. your, uh, mm -hmm. your goal in life is to start this yoga business. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe you can establish a few milestones, like mm -hmm. uh, by next month, I want to incorporate my business. Then after that, mm -hmm. I want to uh, start advertising. So maybe I create five marketing campaigns. Then by month six, I want to have at least 20 clients a month. So there's ways you can... Uh, quantify that. And, and that's the basis of goal setting theory. And the reality mm -hmm. is that it works. And the reality is mm -hmm. that it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. Most people, I think, uh, focus on the <clears throat> wrong metrics, um, mm -hmm. because they're usually a lot easier, and they're less abstract. Mm -hmm. uh, so for instance, you know that success in your business means signing up more clients. Mm -hmm. That means you have to reflect on that. That means you have to reflect on what would be a realistic yet challenging way to measure that. Like number of clients, how many do I want? 20 a month. Is that realistic? Is that feasible? Mm -hmm. That takes a lot more, I guess, reflection and, and cognitive energy than say, okay, I'm going to respond to 30 emails today and then feel good about it. Yeah. Because people... We're more on in our personal life. So I could see the business example because there's lots of examples of business. And you can be taught the business example because there are people who will teach it. But on the personal productivity side, it's all kind of smoke mirrors, guessing. Um, you don't have the tools. You, you, you know, when she captures into her notebook, it doesn't measure anything. Even if she captured into her phone, there's no decent capturing. I've never seen a capturing app that says, oh, look, you've, you're capturing too much. <laughs> you know, you're, yes. you're filter, you need to filter some of this down, like an AI that says, we think there's something wrong with the way you're capturing because, and it explains it to you. There's nothing like that, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's, and to discover that, if you don't have a coach to sit down with every week, or if you don't have a, a structured way of reviewing your performance, you would never discover it, right? No, for sure. And I think the, the the problem when people do that is that they're too focused on the input side of things. So how many how many bits of information do I capture versus the output side of things, which is how many 
important, useful actions or outcomes like, have resulted from these uh, information capture uh, uh, activities. Uh, so input oh. is very easy to measure. Like you said, right. uh, how many thoughts, how many uh, ideas have I noted down today? That's easy. Uh, any, anyone can come up with ideas and note them, note them down. That's the input side of things. That's not productivity. Productivity is the, if you really want to be uh, technical about it, it's uh, the ratio of input to output. Uh, right, or right. output to input rather. And we'll so if your input. input is very high and your output is very low, then by definition, you're not being very productive. However, if you, for the same input, if you increase the amount of output, so like you, based on that information, you created that you'll get business, you signed up a lot of clients, then your productivity increases. Well, because this flies in the, in the face of, I would say some of the conventional wisdom, which is that you capture everything. You know, we, 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 there is a, there is a thought that you leave nothing uncaptured because it would prey on your mind. Um, I don't know how to resolve that other than to say that it's good advice when you're not capturing, but if you're a Karen to say, oh, you should capture some more. We're not talking further overwhelmed because that's what got her into, yeah. into trouble. So it's a. It's it's a different kind of advice for a different kind of person mm -hmm. that's more suitable for someone who's already skilled at capturing, no needs another kind of advice, another a different kind of analysis, a different diagnosis. Yeah. To continue well, to be effective. For for sure. I, I, but I, I think that for everyone, the root of the problem is not so much how much you capture, how much you don't capture. Um I would agree with you. It is it is usually better to capture as much as possible because you don't want them to be nagging, to have that nagging voice in the back of your mind telling you, oh, I'm still thinking about this. I'm still thinking about this. Um, I, I think that people like Karen do not really have that problem because by definition, they're offloading everything. And I think that's good. Um, I think the, the problem arises when you have a huge chunk of information that's just waiting to be acted upon mm -hmm. and it's not being acted upon so the Those notebooks yes yeah and when and that's just a constant them. reminder of everything that's left undone right 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 so so you know karen if we don't solve this problem for her you know this is this is gonna be a, a continual source as long as she stays working and an active and sentient and all the rest of it it's not going to get any better and the anxiety might cause her to dig a deeper hole even um what does someone like a karen typically do to try to fix the problem what, what how, do they try to capture more because they think that's the let me try to be more disciplined and then, you know these kind of people who take notes it, minutes in meetings without being asked to take minutes and you're wondering why are they taking minutes and it's more that sort of compulsion. I wonder if that's what they do. Or do they, if they catch themselves, what do they then do? do? They try not to capture everything or do they keep capturing everything? And or, or do they, hopefully they would do what you said, which is kind of like figure out that I'll sort it out when I sort it out. You know, which, which, which of those solutions do they apply? That's think? a very good question. I, I, I think it, it assumes that uh, people like Karen will realize that their way of operating is a, pro is a problem. Um, the reality is that I feel like most people don't see it as a, as a problem, whether uh, whether in academia or in, in businesses. I've seen people compulsively note down things where I'm like, you, you don't need to note that down. Just uh, be there and be present. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter whether you take that down or not. So I, I assume this is some kind of personality trait where everything mm -hmm. needs to be somewhere and, and that's mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. fine but at some point I think we need that kind of self-awareness when we do realize it's it, it's an issue and, mm -hmm. and it's not specific to um, uh, to information capture like we all have you know most human beings have issues that they're not even aware of whether that's uh, maybe drinking a little too much or uh, eating a little too much or um, you know being stuck in a rut it's it's all kinds of problems that we don't see because we're like a goldfish 
in a uh, in a bowl and and we don't realize that the water around us is not good for us because that's right. it's our environment it's our day-to-day -day, uh, environment and we take it for granted right being driven by some kind of fear or insecurity or um feeling of being less than or something from the past yeah i knew i know someone who was a karen and she had she had the three notebooks and the story that i told is a version of what i i saw her doing and i i think there may have been a time in the past where she f didn't write something down and it proved to be very costly so being driven mm -hmm. by some past failure yeah and that that had that effect of course it was extremely accomplished also this was a person actually ran a company a, a successful company and then there was this like tick you know that 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 uh she dem demonstrated that was like okay that's that's a different kind of behavior never seen anyone do that but it was it was kind of like that but I, the sense i had was that it came from not a healthy place and maybe if there's getting to like okay what happened that drives that behavior today and getting to the source of it mm -hmm. maybe like in a therapeutic kind of relationship could lead to some freedom as opposed to the compulsion that i i i thought i noticed what do you think um, uh, for sure, at, at the, um, I would say that twenty percent of people that come to me with time management issues, in reality, have uh, issues that would be better solved through therapy. Uh, whether it's procrastination, whether it's uh, a lot of things that, like you said, are due to much deeper seated problems than just a time management issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you're right in saying that because these are deeper issues they might escape our conscious attention and so we don't see them as problem it's just the way we live the way we've been living for the past 20 30 or 40 years um and 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 i think one one way to um realize realize that is just uh you know uh, seeking external feedback or when you realize that something is not making you happy maybe uh take that extremely important first step of trying to look into it further than just dismissing it as Oh well, that's just the way I am, because the, the way I am is not necessarily a good thing. It, it's mm -hmm. I, I see it as something to be constantly improved. Mm -hmm. Well, that's our, our our second insight. You know, the twenty percent of folks would have a a therapeutic issue. The twenty percent have a something that's involved in ther therapy, as opposed to something involved by a new way of processing information. That's right. Yeah. If, if it's if, if the therapeutic issue isn't addressed, then it would overwhelm any solution that of a practical nature because of the origin of the whole thing. So you, it's not like they could take a course and then learn a different way of doing it or do some process change and some new technology. And, um, That's correct, yes. Um, but for the 80%, so let, let's say that there's not a therapeutic issue. Um, do you think that there's a, a model of data that they're missing? Most of the Karens are missing about what constitutes the most effective information to be captured. Do you think there's a, a rule of thumb in there? Um, cause so they tend to, they tend to write anything down that's assigned to them, assigned to the other person, anything any factoid yeah. that's of interest, any nice statistic, any quote, any, any URL, any, any, anything, you know, they're kind of busy, like making sure that nothing slips through the cracks. Maybe it's uh, again, that fear of, of missing out, but th there doesn't seem to be any filtering happening on the front end. It just seems to be like a, a dump of everything that they've heard that seems somewhat, you know, the, the bar is low, in other words. <laughs> Anything that exceeds the bar gets put into the notebook. But is that is that a, is there a way to, to apply a filter or to raise the bar, do you think, that would give them some more accuracy or more efficiency? So, um, have you ever um, uh, cooked uh, green peas? I, I can cook a few things. Um, <laughs> green peas. 
yeah, you may have me there. <laughs> I'm not a fan so, of green peas, so green right, peas so in particular, like Jolly the, Green Giant. The thing with yes, uh, the thing with green peas is that I I would rather buy the canned or frozen kind than the fresh kind because when you buy green peas uh, from from the grocery store or from the farmers market and they're fresh, is that you have to open the pods and one by one, you know, uh, t t take out all the the little peas. It's a very time-consuming endeavor. The way I look at it is information is the same thing. You have to realize that going to the grocery store and getting all the all the green peas in a, in a, a fresh, I guess, a format, the fresh kind, that's easy. But when you get home and you actually have to, to cook and you realize that the time and effort that it takes to... Um, to make those peas more actionable, more uh, uh, ready for cooking. Mm -hmm. that, that's quite the endeavor. Mm -hmm. And so when people note down things, maybe one way to uh, to establish a filter, like you said, is, is to think about how much time and effort is this actually going to take me versus how much do I really want it? So in this case, if I was a like a green peas, uh, addict or or fan mm -hmm. like it's my favorite food mm -hmm. presumably i would actually be okay with getting four pounds of fresh green peas and taking the time to uh open the pods and prep and prep them and, and cook them but i'm not i don't like green peas that much and so mm -hmm. i'd rather just uh not eat them <laughs> mm -hmm. at all so that saves me a lot of time or if you know uh, it, it happens that one recipe does call for green peas. I would just get the frozen or the canned kind because it, in the grand scheme of things, it's really not that important to me. So there's a ratio between how much time is this idea going to take you versus how badly do you actually want it? Okay. That's really interesting because it goes to what gets captured, right? Yes. So does she write down green peas? Or does she write down canned green peas, um, pre-cooked green peas, raw green peas? And also, does she write down four pounds of green peas or two cans of green peas? So when she, when she even captures, she's actually committing to a particular um, block of time in her calendar, for example. Yes. Without... But, but but she's not necessarily wittingly doing so. So that's the that's a very important thing that you bring up, which is the believe it or not, there's only like re research on this has started like very recently in 2017, and it's called the opportunity mm -hmm. cost of time. So oh, when we talk okay. about opportunity cost, usually we think about money. So if you, mm -hmm. if yeah, you have right. money you have and spend mm -hmm. it on uh, a car. Mm -hmm. The opportunity cost that you're not spending money on a house. So you're not going to be mm -hmm. owning a house. You're going to be owning a car. And you have to mm -hmm. be okay with that. Uh, the opportunity cost of time is something that we only started talking about very recently because unlike money, it's not a it, – it's, it's not exchangeable one-to-one. -one. So, for instance, mm -hmm. one could say, oh, well, if, if, I'm, if I'm spending time at work uh, – or like if I'm spending time with my kids, that's the opportunity cost is that I'm not making a hundred dollars an hour being at work. But that right, right, right. Right. whereas the opportunity cost of time is, oh, I'm being I'm at work right now working on something that I I'm okay with. But the big the big opportunity cost for me is that I'm not spending precious time with my kid who's growing up and who's childhood time is going to expire at some point and I, and I do want to spend time with him as a father figure. Uh, so that's very important to realize and to keep in mind as you're dealing with more and more information. Uh, to, to give you an example, there's a lot of books on time and the history of time. Lots of articles that come out almost every, every week now. Uh -huh. I do not have time to um, read all of them. Yeah. Uh, so I will be very selective. Uh, like there's one on 
how people thought about time around the first century and Greece and Palestine and the Roman Empire. That's super interesting. Now, there's another one on something that I'm already quite familiar with. I like, even though it would inform me a little better, the marginal outcome for me is very small mm -hmm. compared to reading the one on, hey, I found it fascinating. What did the uh, Roman, uh, the, the people in the Roman Empire, the way they thought about time? That's a lot more in interesting to me because I don't know a lot about it. So the marginal outcome for me is much bigger. Wow, that's interesting because I have the same problem. I, I I used to, and I still collect almost every time management PDF I can find, academic research wise, and I have a store of it on my hard drive, right? But I, I had a similar problem also that, that some of these some of these I I they they they, they seem kind of marginal. And I couldn't find the time. I'm not going to find the time to read them. So do I store them on my hard drive? Well, no one again I've started to say maybe not, you know. Maybe I don't need to have my hard drive filled with every single yeah. time management article that's ever been written since. And, and they're coming out so quickly now that maybe, so maybe back to the green peas, maybe there's a sort of a wisening up, getting smarter about, capturing that I need to get green peas, that over time you start to get more um, more accurate, mm -hmm. more nuanced. Yes, It's not just green peas. It's a particular kind of green peas. And the kind that you're choosing to capture actually is based on some prior commitments that you have. Yes. Yes. It has to be aligned with uh, and by prior commitment I assume that you mean some goal, well-defined goal that you have. Uh, like more time with my kids as opposed correct. to yeah. cooking green peas. Yes, absolutely. But that makes it, that makes things, I was going to say it makes them harder. <laughs> but, it is but, hard. The, but the truth is you're, you're giving yourself the gift because you're getting back some of that opportunity cost, right? It, it, you're, you're, you're actually giving yourself more quality time by not just, capturing everything in its raw form. That's right. And, and I think it's, we live in an oh. era where, hmm. um, you know, we're being told that you can have it all. No, we live in an era where you can have uh, less and less of it all because there's more and more stuff out there. Like you want to, I had a friend, a, a colleague, a professor who, uh, wow. I think six years ago, he told me, he used to tell me, oh, I'm good now. I'm all caught up. I was like, what do you mean I'm all caught up? He said, well, there's uh, this TV, Stop. Show that TV, there's Breaking Bad, there's uh, th that show, there's that show, and they had new seasons. And he's like, okay, I'm all caught up. I made the time to watch them all. And he had this sense of urgency where if there's a new big TV show out there, he had to watch it. And just today on my social media, I shared this mm. graph where you see that around the year 2000, he had very few new TV shows per year around the year 2000. Now in 2022 okay. or 2023, you have more than 2,000 new TV shows, not even new seasons. That's new TV shows, 2,000 of them every single year. So in the year 2022, there's 2,000 new TV shows, which you is- can't watch all of those. Yeah, absolutely impossible to watch them in a lifetime, uh, like you said earlier, if if you wanted to watch all the existing TV shows, a lifetime would not be enough. That that I don't know where get, we're getting into solutions now, but so there's 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 some kind of filtering that Karen needs to do that we all need to do because we I, and the way you said it, but I, I don't know if you can quote it. Is that is that is that an, a fresh insight or did you bring that one to the party? The one about um, we can't do it all. And in fact, we're doing less of all because there's more all than there ever was before. Is that? That is a new? that is such a fresh insight that I actually came up with it uh, a minute ago. Uh, I'm, I'm not kidding. That's because our third insight. <laughs> that's been on a phone call. That that's gonna be on an episode, by the way, because <laughs> that, that one. <laughs> well, because that's, I was thinking, you know, like people I do say, so "Oh, you can't have it all. You can't have it all." Or like, "I want yeah. to have it all." Uh, that works in an like a 1950s. Yeah, timeline where yeah, 
Yeah. Maybe there's a few new books every year, like maybe yeah. the three broadcast channels that are available yeah. after some new yeah. shows. Maybe you can do that. You can't have it all today, not because uh, we can't, but because the all, so like everything that's out there, right. has increased exponentially. So you 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 must choose to have less of all there is and not have that equate to failure. That's I think the sense, the concept of sacrifice has become more important in the sense that you have to realize you have 24 hours in a day, the same 24 hours in a day that we've had since the, I guess, beginning of civilization. The difference is that now there's so many more things we can do at any point in time. It used to be that, you know, you want to buy something in the store, you have to go to the store and the store is open from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Now it's open 24 7, 24 7, 365 days a year uh, online. You don't even have to go to the store. And when you go online on Amazon, you, you, you don't have to choose like between one or the other toothbrush. There's probably hundreds, if not thousands of different uh, models you can choose from. So, yes. You can't buy it, each one and test it, can you? <laughs> exactly. So um, I, I think people have to become more and more at peace with this idea of sacrifice. I only have 24 hours in a day. I better spend it on things that, on the few things that matter the most. So, so it's, it's, a filter is a part of the solution, but there is a sort of an accepting that there will be sacrifice. There is, by, by definition that you live in 2023, you must sacrifice. So this That's is, right. So this just is to what get we're getting at here. Filter, because I, I assume we're at a point where we can talk about solutions. Is that correct? Yep, 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 yep. So I, I think that a good way to think about it is a halfway point. So you know when you go from a point A to point B and you're on a train, sometimes you're at a halfway point. There's a point... A and a half or like some point I in the in the middle. Um, I think the same thing can be extremely useful when we talk about information capture. So at point A, you capture a lot of information. And then at the end, the goal is to implement that information or at least organize it, put it in your uh, calendar, put it in your OneNote, doesn't matter. But in the mean in, in, in the middle, is there something that you can do to be to to, uh, to resist or at least to mitigate the fact that we almost always over capture. And so the technique that I think is very useful here is you can have a repository where you capture almost everything that you think is important at the time, like in the heat of the moment. Uh, to make things even more, I guess, concrete, here's how I do it. I have this app called Google Keep, and it's yeah, I use it. I use it too. Yeah, it's great, and it's great because yep, yep. it's instantaneous. Mm -hmm. I don't have to like open an, an app and then uh, click on that button or this button. All I do is literally grab my phone and then uh, be like, "Hey Google, note to self," and then I dictate my note. It works on my phone. It works on my uh, home assistants. It works on my earbuds when I'm walking or or, or oh, biking. I didn't so know I, that. Oh. So it's 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 a very integrated ecosystem where I can take notes from pretty much any Either. device that I own, whether I'm mm -hmm. cycling, walking, uh, taking a bath, doing the dishes, doesn't matter. It's always there. Now, the barriers between me and saving an idea or a thought are very, very low. And that's what I want. I don't want uh -huh. anything to stand between me and a potential good idea. Uh -huh. Now, that's what I do in the heat of the moment as things mm -hmm. come up. What I also do is that every day uh, when I finish work, I have a routine where I go through my Google notes for the day. And so I look at them and now, you know, a few hours have passed by. I look at them with a, I guess, a, a, a new set of eyes. Right. And some of them I just delete because I'm like, oh, that <laughs> sounded like a good idea, but it's right. either impractical or not that important to me. And then the others are, uh, turns out that they're actually quite insightful and very important to me. And then they have to go somewhere else. Right. 
Google Keep, Google Note is just the halfway point. Now you right. have to, to put them on a train to where they belong. So for right. instance, if one of the Google Notes was, oh, this is a great idea for a blog post, then that goes straight into my repository where I have a list of ideas for my blog right. post. Or right. the other one might be, oh, um, uh, uh, spend time with my partner um, and you know go to a restaurant. So right. do just set a time on my calendar uh, with that particular, uh, you know, I said this time, uh -huh. place, restaurant, and so on. That's done. So there's always an endpoint. The endpoint is either my calendar, my uh, could be my my uh, my tasks, my OneNote. It doesn't really matter. But the endpoint is where the things start to be implemented. Right. For, for instance, a if it's scheduled on my calendar that I'm going with my uh, wife to a uh, a restaurant that will be done right that's we're almost near that because if something is on my calendar it will be done right. um if it's on my list of blog posts at some point at some point i will be writing a blog post about it and that's where i create this great filter where in the heat of the moment you know i always want to note something down then uh, around the end of the day i can decide whether okay so I apply this extra filter. Do I really need this? Is this really important? And then it, based on what you said before, there's an idea of the, the input and the output. Yes. So almost like the yield. So the yield of your, are you concerned that the yield of your capturing, the transition from A to B, not the halfway point, but the A to the B, should we be concerned? Because it sounds as if we should be, that there's too much capture going on for the yield at the other end, that that there's it's ineffective to capture five thousand to do one task. That that's somewhere in there. There's some ineffectiveness, and that it there effective capture is more balanced with the output to some degree. Somewhere in there, there's a tipping point. So it's it's very interesting that you talk about yield because I I see this process as separating the wheat from the chaff. Chat, uh -huh. Or you know when you signal get from a lot of wheat, the noise. So that, no, sorry, signal from the noise. Exactly. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, and we all have ideas that we want to save or capture in the heat of the moment. That's great. Mm -hmm. I think that should be encouraged. Um, but you need to have at some point, like a, a halfway point, where you separate the wheat from the chaff. And right. and very often you're going to realize that maybe a third or maybe half or maybe more of the ideas were in re in, in hindsight. Uh, either not useful, not practical, or, or just not of interest anymore. Right, 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 right. So an effective, an effective halfway point would would produce a great quality yield, so that everything that gets yep. through the, the 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 filter, so to speak, or it gets through Google Keep into your calendar gets done. Yes. As you did emphasize, everything that gets placed in one of those implementation places gets done. Yes. Absolutely. Great. And so the halfway that, point. That part's faithful. The halfway point is just like a point of triage. Exactly. And it helps you get, get at least maybe a, a few hours of uh, let it cool down. So I, I, I don't know. I don't know about uh, Jamaica. I don't know. I'm let not sure cool about down. the US. But mm -hmm. in Canada, there's a law that if you want to divorce someone, you have to wait a year before between the, the time you announce it and the time you actually uh, sign the papers. And the reason for that yeah, is that a long time, time, Brad. It is a long time. It's a very long time. I, I've, I've had one of those, and a year would have been painful. That's all I could say. So, a year would have been... It, it, yes, it, it is painful, uh, but I assume that the, the logic behind it is that sometimes we make decisions in the heat of the moment that when you take time to cool down, you realize that Okay, maybe I don't want to get a divorce. Or very often, what happens is that people, are, no, I'm like, yes, yes, I'm very sure that I want to get a divorce even a year after. Uh, so this halfway point works the same way. Like we have a lot of ideas that, in the heat of the moment, we like and we think, okay, we're going to do this. But then a few hours later, we're like, oh, I'm not too sure about this. Or if you still are sure about it and you think still think it's a great idea, that to me is a great indicator that that should be done. Right, 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 right. So there, there's there's that time to to consider. Um, 
But if again, back to Karen, if your time to consider what you need to work on, the processing time, you know, it, at some point, if you're spending 10 hours processing to determine that you only have one task to do, at some point, you know, the opportunity, again, opportunity cost. So doing all of that capturing and even considering the 10 hours of activities that you're going through, is it worth it? And I think the answer would be no, right? There's there's some point at which Karen could reduce the input and get the same output, in other words. That's a very good question. Um, and that's why I recommend doing the the, the cleaning, the cleanup daily, because every day, unless you're an absolute genius, you're not going to have 100 ideas or 100 things to note down, uh, maybe five maybe six, maybe 10. And that's doable. Like if you take right. five minutes at the end of the workday, just five minutes to go through 10 ideas and right. ask yourself, do I keep this? And if I keep it, where should it go? Should it go uh, in my calendar, my OneNote, my Notion? That that should not take more than five minutes. And I think that five minutes is time very well spent. However, if you do find yourself, that, if you find yourself having to spend 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes doing that every day, to me, that's a clear indicator that, again, either you're an extreme genius or uh, maybe you're uh, compulsively noting down a lot of things that are of little value. Right. And and, and there are the, the probability of them, somewhere you're at the bottom of the distribution, down in the tail, capturing all kinds of stuff just in case. Yeah. But, but the truth is you want to be you know, the fat part of the fat part of the distribution where the yeah. things you're capturing have a high probability of turning into the task, not a low probability, which then takes all this time to process, which then has you be kind of compulsive and maybe even runs up your anxiety yeah. and gives you fear of missing out. Well, I've, I've never had a conversation like this one before. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> this is a really, this is a, this is a good one. So uh, Brad, we got to wrap it up, but we're, we could keep going. I just want to be clear. This is there could be a part two to this very easily, but in the interest of our our, our listeners and you know they have opportunity costs as well. Uh, Brad, how can folks get a get a hold of you and the work that you do and um, enjoy more of your thinking? So three times a week, I um, share new research um, and and what it means for you in terms of tips to better manage your time. Uh, and um, I'm available on LinkedIn. Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, my name is Brad Eon. It's Brad uh, A E O N. And um, yeah, as, as much as I can, I try to translate scientific research into actionable tips. And is it on Twitter? Is it at Brad Eon? That's correct. Is that yes. the handle? Great, yeah. great, great. So I follow folks, I follow Brad on, on LinkedIn, and there's always something of, of value each week. I can, I can promise you that. And there's nobody else doing the kind of research that he's doing that I'm even remotely aware of, not even like 10% of the value that he produces in this area. So Thank you. Brad, thanks so much again for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Great. We're not finished folks. There's going to be a little bit more information about our next episode. So keep listening. And here's an excerpt from our next episode with Ben Kirk. So it's quite possible that they were just having their standard meetings, going around the table, doing the standard presentation, doing the standard reports, the standard briefings, and maybe they weren't opening it up for people to be open-minded for innovation, to give this guy, this inventor, a chance to really uh, explain his invention. Maybe they were just doing the standard thing over and over and over again, which is this sort of story that, that we hear about meetings. We seem like, hang on, we did the same meeting two weeks ago. We were covered over the same things. Uh, and maybe that's what happened to Kodak. I mean, I guess we can only suppose. And if you want to leave a comment about this episode or any aspect of the work that we're doing here at the Task Management and Time Blocking Podcast, you can go over to www.replytofrancis.info and send me either a message uh, by text or send me a voice message, a voice note.
And as you probably know, we have a couple of places that you can interact with other people. Talk about this episode. One is at the community, mightytaskers.scheduleu.org. And you'll see the link in the show notes. And the other, of course, is our upcoming Task Management and Time Blocking Summit coming up in March. Two outstanding opportunities to interact with other people about the ideas that you've heard on this podcast or any of our episodes that are coming up. And if you'd like to support the work we're doing, I invite you to click on the Patreon link below to make a donation. And please don't forget to like our show and recommend it to others on iTunes, Stitcher, Google, or whatever past podcast app or service you're using. This is Francis Wade. I'm signing out. I hope to see you on a future episode. And until then, take care and all the best. See you later.